to Mrs. Saville, England. St. Petersburg, December the 11th, 1784. My dear sister, I write a few lines in haste to say that I am say your affectionate Robert brother, Robert Walton, to Mrs. Saville, England, August the 5th, 1785. So strange an accident has happened to us. Last Monday, we were nearly surrounded by ice. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were compassed round by a thick fog. We accordingly lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. About two o'clock, the mist cleared and we beheld vast and irregular, endless plains of ice. Suddenly, we perceived a low carriage fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs about half a mile distant. The shape of a man, but of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge. We watched the rapid progress of the traveller with our telescopes until he was lost among the ice. In the morning, I went upon deck and found the sailors talking to someone on a sledge which had drifted towards us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Good God! Margaret, if you had seen the man when he came aboard, I never saw anyone in so wretched a condition. His limbs were nearly frozen. When my guest was a little recovered, we asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom, and he replied, to seek one who fled from me. I am Victor Frankenstein, by birth a Genovese. Alphonse, my father, was respected by all who knew him and in his young days was occupied by the affairs of his country. A variety of circumstances had prevented his marrying early, so it was not until the decline of life that he became a husband and the father of a family. For a long time, I was their only care. My mother, Caroline, had much desired to have a daughter, but I continued their single offspring. When I was about five years old, they passed a week on the shores of the Lake of Como. Her benevolent disposition often made her enter the cottages of the poor. This, to my mother, was more than a duty. Remembering what she had suffered and how she had fallen into poverty after her father died, leaving Caroline an orphan and a beggar before my father arrived to protect her. During a walk, a poor dwelling attracted our notice as being singularly disconsolate. We found a peasant and his wife, hard-working, bent down by care and labour, distributing a scanty meal to five hungry babes. Four were dark-eyed, hardy little souls. One was thin and very fair. The peasant woman explained she was not her child, but the daughter of a Milanese nobleman whose mother had died in childbirth. My mother prevailed on her rustic guardians to yield their charge to her. They consulted their village priest, resulting in Elizabeth Lavenza becoming the inmate of my parents' house. Everyone loved Elizabeth. On the evening previous to her being brought to my home, my mother had said playfully, I have a present for my Victor. Tomorrow he shall have it. And when, on the morrow, she presented Elizabeth to me, I looked upon her as mine. 
to protect, love and cherish. No human being could have passed a happier childhood than myself. My temper was sometimes violent and my passions vehement. They were turned not towards childish pursuits, but to an eager desire to learn the secrets of heaven and earth. And whether it was the inner spirit of nature and the mysterious soul of man, my inquiries were directed to the metaphysical or, in its highest sense, the physical secrets of the world. Curiosity, earnest research to learn the hidden laws of nature, gladness akin to rapture as they were unfolded to me are among the earliest sensations I can remember. On the birth of William, my brother, my parents gave up their wandering life. We possessed a house in Geneva and a campagna on Belle Reve, the eastern shore of the Lake Geneva, where we principally resided. I feel exquisite pleasure in dwelling on the recollections of childhood before misfortune had tainted my mind and changed its bright visions of extensive usefulness into gloomy and narrow reflections upon self. When I was 13 years of age, we all went on a party of pleasure to the baths near Tonon. The inclemency of the weather obliged us to remain a day confined to the inn. In this house, I chanced to find a volume of the works of the alchemist Cornelius Agrippa. I opened it with apathy. The theory which he attempts to demonstrate and the wonderful facts which he relates soon changed this feeling into enthusiasm. A new light seemed to dawn upon my mind. Bounding with joy, I communicated my discovery to my father. Ah, oh, Cornelius Agrippa! Oh, my dear Victor, do not waste your time upon this. It is sad trash. If he had taken the pains to explain that the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded, I should certainly have thrown Agrippa aside and contented my imagination by returning with greater ardour to my former studies. Instead, I became Agrippa's disciple. While I followed the routine of education in the schools of Geneva, I was to a great degree self-taught with regard to my favourite studies. Under the guidance of my new teacher, I entered into the search of the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, but the latter soon obtained my undivided attention. Wealth was an inferior object, but what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death? And thus, for a time, I was occupied by exploded systems, mingling a thousand contradictory theories, guided by an ardent imagination and childish reasoning, till an accident again changed the current of my ideas. When I was about 15 years old, we had retired to our house near Belle Reve, when we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. It advanced from behind the mountains of Jura, and the thunder burst with frightful loudness from various quarters of the heavens. Watching the storm with curiosity and delight, I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak which stood about 20 yards from our house, and so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When we visited it the next morning, we found the tree shattered in a singular manner. 
It was not splintered by the shock, but entirely reduced to thin ribbons of wood. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. Before this, I was not unacquainted with the more obvious laws of electricity. On this occasion, a man of great research in natural philosophy was with us, and excited by this catastrophe, he explained his theory of electricity and galvanism, which was at once new and astonishing to me. All that he said threw Cornelius Agrippa into the shade. All that had so long engaged my attention suddenly grew <laughs> despicable. By one of those caprices of the mind, which we are perhaps most subject to in early youth, I set down natural history and all its progeny as a deformed and abortive creation. In this mood of mind, I betook myself to the mathematics and the branches of study appertaining to that science built upon secure foundations and so worthy of my consideration. When I had attained the age of 17, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt in Germany. My father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date, but before that day arrived, the first misfortune of my life occurred. An omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth caught the scarlet fever her illness was severe, and she was in the greatest of danger. With my mother attending her sickbed, her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignity of the distemper. Elizabeth was saved, but the consequences of this imprudence were fatal to her preserver. On the third day, my mother sickened. Her fever was accompanied by the most alarming symptoms. On her deathbed, the fortitude and benignity of this best of women did not desert her. She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. My children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. Alas, I regret that I am taken from you, and happy and beloved as I have been, is it not hard to quit you all? I will endeavour to resign myself cheerfully to death, and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly, and her countenance expressed affection even in death. The first two or three days of my residence at Ingolstadt were chiefly spent in becoming acquainted with the localities and the principal residents in my new abode. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, I attended Professor Waldman's lecture upon chemistry. My mind filled with one thought. So much has been done. <laughs> More. Far more will I achieve. I will pioneer a new way. One of the phenomena which had peculiarly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame. To examine the causes of life, we must first have recourse to death. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. 
I must also observe the corruption and natural decay of the human body. Now I was led to examine the cause and progress of this decay and spent days and nights in vaults and carnal houses. After days and nights of incredible labour and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay, more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. To arrive at the summit of my desires was the most gratifying consummation of my toils. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself, but my imagination was too much exalted to doubt my ability to give life to a man. So I began the creation of a human being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved to make the being a gigantic stature, about eight feet in height and proportionably large. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards, like a hurricane in the first enthusiasm of success. Life and death appeared to me ideal bounds, which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. In a solitary chamber at the top of the house, I kept my workshop of filthy creation. The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials, and often did my human nature turn with loathing from my occupation, whilst still urged on by an eagerness brought my work near to a conclusion. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. Anxiously, I infused a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. <laughs> beautiful? Oh, great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this, I had deprived myself of rest and health, and now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished. And breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, 
I rushed out of the room to my bedchamber. I threw myself on the bed in my clothes. I slept, but was disturbed by the wildest dreams. I started from my sleep with horror. By the dim and yellow light of the moon, I beheld the wretch, the, the miserable monster whom I had created. His eyes were fixed on me. His jaws opened and he muttered some inarticulate sounds while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. No mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy endued with animation could not be so hideous as that wretch. I had gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. Eventually, I returned to my room. I threw the door forcibly open, but nothing appeared. The apartment was empty. I could hardly believe that so great a good fortune could have befallen me. I, I clapped my hands for joy and laughed aloud. <laughs> this was the commencement of a nervous fever which confined me for several months. <laughs> Slowly, I recovered. I remember the first time I perceived that the young buds were shooting forth from the trees that shaded my window. It was a divine spring, and the season contributed greatly to my convalescence. I felt also sentiments of joy and affection revive. And in a short time, I became as cheerful as before I was attacked by the fatal passion. I had not seen my family for six years and was planning my return to Geneva when I received a letter from my father saying, I have some horrible tidings I have to convey to you. William is dead. That sweet child whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle yet so full of joy. Victor, he is murdered. He did not attempt to console me, instead related the circumstances of my brother's death. The lovely boy, whom the night before he had seen blooming and active in health, was found stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. The print of the murderous finger was on his neck. I wept like a child. My father implored me to return home and be their comforter. It was completely dark when I arrived near Geneva, which I had not seen for nearly six years. I spent the night at a village half a league distant. The sky was serene. Unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. On my way, I saw the lightning playing on the summit of Mont Blanc. Darkness and storm increased every minute. Thunder burst with a terrific crash over my head. This noble war in the sky elevated my spirits. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral. This thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees. I could not be mistaken. Its gigantic stature, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. What do 
Did he there? Could he be the murderer of my brother? Nothing in human shape could have destroyed the fair child. No sooner did that idea cross my imagination than I became convinced of its truth. He was the murderer. Our house was the house of mourning. My father's health was deeply shaken by the horror of the recent events. Elizabeth was sad and desponding. All pleasure seemed to her sacrilege towards the dead. Resolving to ascend to the summit of Montanvert, I hired a mule, a more sure-footed beast than a horse, and least liable to receive injury on these rugged roads. I spent nearly two hours in crossing the fields of ice, almost a league in width. Suddenly, I beheld the figure of a man advancing towards me with superhuman speed, sight tremendous and abhorred. He bounded over the crevices in the ice, among which I had walked with caution. I felt a faintness seize me as I perceived that it was the wretch whom I had created. I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to wait his approach and then close with him in mortal combat. Devil, I exclaimed, do you dare approach me? Be gone, vile insect, or rather stay, that I may trample you to dust, and oh, that I could, with the extinction of your miserable existence, restore those victims whom you have so diabolically murdered. I expected this reception. All men hate the wretched. Yet you, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature, to whom thou art bound by ties only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us. Do your duty towards me, and I will do mine towards you and the rest of mankind. If you will comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the moor of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. Hear my tale. It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being. All the events of that period appear confused and indistinct. A strange multiplicity of sensations seized me, and I saw, felt, heard, and smelt at the same time. And it was indeed a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. One morning, a gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. I gazed with a kind of wonder. Several changes of day and night passed when I began to distinguish my sensations from each other. I learnt that fire provided both heat and light. I gathered berries from the trees. Food however, became scarce, and I often spent the whole day searching in vain for a few acorns to assuage the pangs of hunger. I walked for three or four days. I arrived at a village. How miraculous did this appear! I entered one of the houses. I had hardly placed my foot within the door before the children shrieked, and one of the women fainted. The whole village was roused. Some attacked me until grievously bruised by stones. I escaped to the open country and fearfully took refuge in a hovel, an agreeable asylum from the snow and rain. From the safety of my hovel, 
I could watch an old man in the adjoining cottage playing an instrument for his family, producing sounds sweeter than the voice of the thrush or the nightingale. It was a lovely sight, even to me, poor wretch, who had never beheld aught beautiful before. I withdrew from the window, unable to bear these emotions. I longed to join them, but dared not. I decided that for the present I would remain quietly in my hovel, watching and endeavouring to discover the motives which influenced their actions. I had admired the perfect forms of the family, their grace, beauty, and delicate complexions. But how was I terrified when I viewed myself in a transparent pool? At first I started back, unable to believe that it was indeed I who was reflected in the mirror. And when I became fully convinced that I was in reality the monster that I am, I was filled with the bitterest of sensations of despondence and mortification. <laughs> Days passed in the same routines. I later learned the family name was De Lacy. The young man, Felix, was constantly employed out of doors and the girl, Agatha, in various laborious occupations within. The old man, whom I soon perceived to be blind, employed his leisure hours playing his instrument or in contemplation. Eventually, I discovered one of the causes of the uneasiness of this amiable family was poverty. Their nourishment consisted entirely of the vegetables from their garden and the milk of one cow. During winter, the two youngsters suffered the pangs of hunger very poignantly, as several times they placed food before the old man, when they reserved none for themselves. This trait of kindness moved me sensibly. I had been accustomed to steal a part of their store for my own consumption, but when I found that in doing this I inflicted pain upon them, I abstained. My mode of life in my hovel was uniform. During the morning I attended the motions of the family, and when they were dispersed in various occupations, I slept. The remainder of the day was spent in observing my friends. When they had retired to rest, if there was any moon or the night was starlight, I went into the woods and collected my own food of berries, nuts and roots, as well as fuel for the cottage. When necessary, I cleared their path from the snow and left them wood for their fire. I afterwards found that these labours greatly astonished them. And once or twice I heard them utter the words, Good spirit. Wonderful. <laughs> but I did not then understand the significance of these terms. My days were spent in close attention that I might more speedily master their language. While I improved in speech, I also learned the science of letters, and this opened before me a wide field for wonder and delight. <sighs> what a strange nature is knowledge. It clings to the mind when it has once seized on it, like a lichen on a rock. These teachings inspired me with strange feelings. Was man indeed at once so powerful, so virtuous and magnificent, yet so vicious and base? They induced me to turn towards myself. What was I? 
I possessed no money, no friends, no property, no name. I was endued with a figure hideously deformed and loathsome. I was not even of the same nature as man. Was I, then, a monster? A blot upon the earth from which all men fled and whom all men disowned? One night, I found a leathern portmanteau containing several articles of dress and a book, Paradise Lost, which excited in me deep emotions. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence. He had come forth from the hands of God. He was allowed to converse with beings of a superior nature. But I was wretched, helpless, and alone. Another circumstance strengthened and confirmed these feelings. I discovered some papers in the pocket of the clothes which I had taken from your laboratory. It was your journal that minutely described every step you took in the progress of my accursed origin. Why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? Then, one day, the opportunity arose. Everyone departed, leaving the blind old man alone. I entered the cottage, explaining I was a traveller in need of some rest. I am an unfortunate and deserted creature. I have no relation or friend upon earth. Effort destroyed all my remaining strength. I sank on the chair and sobbed aloud. At that moment, I heard footsteps. I had not a moment to lose. I begged the old man, save and protect me. You and your family are the friends whom I seek. At that instant, the cottage door opened and the rest entered. <sighs> Who can describe their horror and consternation on beholding me? Agatha fainted. Felix darted forward and with supernatural force tore me from his father to whose knees I clung. In a transport of fury, I could have torn him limb from limb, but my heart sank within me and I refrained. Overcome by pain and anguish, I quitted the cottage and in the general tumult escaped unperceived to my hovel. Cursed, cursed creator, why did I live? Why, in that instant, did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you had so wantonly bestowed? I know not. Despair had not yet taken possession of me. My feelings were those of rage and revenge. I could, with pleasure, have destroyed the cottage and its inhabitants and have glutted myself with their shrieks and misery. The family fled. I never saw any of the de Lacy's more. At length, the thought of you crossed my mind. You had mentioned in your journal Geneva as the name of your native town, and towards this place I resolved to proceed. It took me two months to reach the environs of Geneva. It was evening when I arrived. At this time, a slight sleep relieved me from the pain of reflection, which was disturbed by a beautiful child who came running into where I was sleeping. As I gazed on him, an idea seized me that this little creature was unprejudiced and had lived too short a time to have imbibed a horror of deformity. If, therefore, I could educate him as my companion and friend, I should not be so desolate in this peopled earth. I seized the boy. But as soon as he beheld my form, he placed his hands before his eyes and uttered a shrill scream. 
I drew his hand forcibly from his face and said, Child, I do not intend to hurt you. Listen to me. He struggled violently. Monster, he cried. Ugly wretch, let me go. My papa is Monsieur Frankenstein. He will punish you. You dare not keep me. Frankenstein, you belong then to my enemy, to him towards whom I have sworn eternal revenge. You shall be my first victim. The child still struggled and loaded me with epithets which carried despair to my heart. I grasped his throat to silence him. And in a moment, he lay dead at my feet. I gazed on my victim and my heart swelled with exultation and hellish triumph. I too can create desolation. My enemy is not invulnerable. This death shall torment and destroy him. For some days I haunted the spot where these scenes had taken place. I was consumed by a burning passion which you alone can gratify. We may not part until you have promised to comply with my requisition. I am alone and miserable. Man will not associate with me. I beg you to create a female as my companion, similar to myself. One as deformed and horrible as myself would not deny herself to me. Gratify me. This being you must create. I could no longer suppress the rage that burned within me. I do refuse it. I replied, and no torture shall ever extort a consent from me. Shall I create another like yourself, whose joint wickedness might desolate the world? Be gone! I have answered you. I will never consent. You are in the wrong, replied the fiend. I am malicious because I am miserable. Am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? Shall I respect man when he condemns me? If I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear. And chiefly towards you, my arch enemy, I will work at your destruction, nor finish until I desolate your heart so that you shall curse the hour of your birth. Do you not reflect that you are the cause of its excess? If any being felt emotions of benevolence towards me, I should return them a hundred and a hundredfold. What I ask of you is reasonable and moderate. A creature of another sex, but as hideous as myself. It is true, we shall be monsters, but on that account we shall be more attached to one another. Oh, my creator, make me happy. Do not. Deny me my request. I shuddered when I thought of the possible consequences of my consent, but I felt that there was some justice in his argument. He saw my change of feeling and continued, if you consent. Neither you nor any other human being shall ever see us again. His words had a strange effect upon me. 
You swear, I said, to be harmless. My virtues will necessarily arise when I live in communion with an equal and feel the affections of a sensitive being. I paused some time. Then I replied, I consent to your demand on your solemn oath to quit Europe forever and every other place in the neighborhood of man as soon as I shall deliver into your hands a female who will accompany you in your exile. I swear, he cried, by the sun and by the blue sky of heaven. Commence your labors. I shall watch their progress with unutterable anxiety and fear not but that when you are ready, I shall appear. Saying this, he suddenly quitted me, fearful perhaps of any change in my sentiments. I saw him descend the mountain with greater speed than the flight of an eagle and was quickly lost among the undulations of the sea of ice. I returned immediately to Geneva. As I proceeded in my labor, it became every day more horrible and irksome to me. Three years before, I had created a fiend. I was now about to form another being. She might become 10,000 times more malignant than her mate and delight for its own sake in murder and wretchedness. He had sworn to quit the neighborhood of man, but she had not. The demon might thirst for children, and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth. Had I right, for my own benefit, to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? I trembled, and my heart failed within me when, on looking up, I saw, by the light of the moon, the demon at the casement. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me. He now came to mark my progress and claim the fulfillment of my oath. I thought, with a sensation of madness on my promise of creating another like him and, trembling with passion, tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. The wretch saw me destroy the creature on whose future existence he depended for happiness, and with a howl of devilish despair and revenge, cried out, You have destroyed the work which you began. Do you dare to break your promise and my hopes? Be gone! I do break my promise. Never will I create another like yourself, equal in deformity and wickedness. You believe yourself miserable, but I can make you so wretched that the light of day will be hateful to you. You are my creator, but I am your master. Obey. The monster gnashed his teeth in the impotence of anger. Shall each man cried he, find a wife for his bosom, and each beast have his mate, and I be alone. I may die, but first you shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Beware, for I am fearless, and therefore powerful. Devil, cease. I have declared my resolution to you. Leave me. I am inexorable. It is well. I go. But remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. Moments later, I saw him in a boat shoot across the waters and was soon lost amidst the waves. Soon after my arrival home, 
my father spoke of my immediate marriage with Elizabeth. I remained silent. My father inquired sadly, have you some other attachment? None on earth. I love Elizabeth and look forward to our union with delight. Let the day therefore be fixed, and on it I will consecrate myself to the happiness of my wife. After the ceremony, a large party assembled at my father's, but it was agreed that Elizabeth and I should commence our journey immediately by water, sleeping that night at Avian and continuing our voyage on the following day. The day was fair, the wind favourable. All smiled on our nuptial embarkation. Those were the last moments of my life during which I enjoyed the feeling of happiness. It was eight o'clock when we landed. We walked for a short time on the shore, enjoying the transitory light, and then retired to the inn and contemplated the lovely scene of waters, woods, and mountains, obscured in darkness, yet still displaying their black outlines. I had been calm during the day, but as night obscured the shapes of objects, a thousand fears arose in my mind. I was anxious and watchful, while my right hand grasped a pistol which was hidden in my bosom. Every sound terrified me. I passed an hour in this state of mind, when I reflected how fearful the combat would be to my wife. I earnestly entreated her to retire, resolving not to join her until I had obtained some knowledge as to the situation of my enemy. She left me, and I continued some time walking up and down the passages of the house and inspecting every corner that might afford a retreat to my adversary. But I discovered no trace of him, and was beginning to conjecture that some fortunate chance had intervened to prevent the execution of his menaces. When suddenly I heard a shrill and dreadful scream. It came from the room into which Elizabeth had retired. As I heard it, the whole truth rushed into my mind. I could feel the blood trickling in my veins and tingling in the extremities of my limbs. This state lasted but for an instant. The scream was repeated. I rushed into the room. Elizabeth, my love, my wife, so lately living, so dear, so worthy, lifeless and inanimate thrown across the bed, her head hanging down, and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. I embraced her with ardour, but the deadly languor and coldness of the limbs told me that what I now held in my arms had ceased to be the Elizabeth whom I had loved and cherished. The murderous mark of the fiend's grasp was on her neck, and her breath had ceased to issue from her lips. While I still hung over her in the agony of despair, I happened to look up. I felt a kind of panic on seeing the pale yellow light of the moon illuminate the chamber. The shutters had been thrown back, and I saw at the open window a figure, the most hideous and abhorred. A grin was on the face of the monster. He seemed to jeer as with his fiendish finger he pointed towards the corpse of my wife. I rushed towards the window and drawing a pistol from my bosom fired. Oh, but he eluded me, leapt from his station, and running with the swiftness of lightning, plunged into the lake. With the death of William and Elizabeth, I knew not if my father was safe from the malignity of the fiend. 
so I resolved to return to Geneva with all possible speed. I found, on arriving, my father yet lived, but he sunk under the tidings that I bore. His eyes wandered in vacancy, for they had lost their charm and their delight. His Elizabeth, his more than daughter, whom he doted on with all that affection, cursed. Cursed be the feet. The springs of existence suddenly gave way. My father was unable to rise from his bed, and in a few days he died in my arms. Before I quitted Geneva, I visited the cemetery where William, Elizabeth, and my father reposed. Everything was silent. The night was nearly dark. The spirits of the departed seemed to flit around and to cast a shadow around the head of the mourner. The deep grief gave way to rage and despair. They were dead and I lived. Their murderer also lived and to destroy him I must drag out my weary existence. I knelt on the grass and kissed the earth and with quivering lips exclaimed, by the sacred earth on which I kneel, by the shades that wander near me, by the deep and eternal grief that I feel, I swear to pursue the demon who caused this misery until he or I shall perish in mortal conflict. For this purpose, I will preserve my life. I call on you spirits of the dead, and on you, wandering ministers of vengeance, to aid and conduct me in my work. Let the cursed and hellish monster drink deep of agony. Let him feel the despair that now torments me. I was answered through the stillness of night by a loud and fiendish laugh. The mountains re-echoed it and I felt as if all hell surrounded me with mockery and laughter. Surely in that moment I should have been possessed with frenzy and have destroyed my miserable existence. But my vow was heard and I was reserved for vengeance. The laughter died away when a well-known and a bored voice, apparently close to my ear, addressed me in an audible whisper. I am satisfied, miserable wretch. You have determined to live, and I am satisfied. I darted towards the spot from which the sound proceeded, but the devil eluded my grasp. Suddenly, the broad disk of the moon arose and shone full upon his ghastly and distorted shape as the fiend fled with more than mortal speed. And so, my wanderings began. I pursued him, and for many months this has been my task. Sometimes he left marks in writing on the barks of trees or cut in stone that guided me and instigated my fury. My reign is not yet over. These words were legible in one of these inscriptions. Follow me. I seek the everlasting ices of the north where you will feel the misery of cold and frost to which I am impassive. Your toils only just begin. Wrap yourself in furs and provide food for we shall enter upon a journey where your sufferings will satisfy my everlasting hatred. <laughs> My beloved sister, you have read this strange and terrific story, and do you not... Great God! What a scene has just taken place. I am yet dizzy with the remembrance of it. I entered the cabin. Over Victor's body hung a form which I cannot find words to describe. Gigantic in stature, yet uncouth and distorted in its proportions. 
When he heard the sound of my approach, he ceased to utter exclamations of grief and sprung towards the window. Never did I behold a vision so horrible as his face. I shut my eyes involuntarily, yet called on him to stay. He paused, looking on me with wonder, and again turning towards the lifeless form of his creator. Oh, Frankenstein, generous and self-devoted being. What does it avail that I now ask thee to pardon me? I, who irretrievably destroyed thee by destroying all thou lovedst. Hypocritical fiend, I exclaimed. It is not pity that you feel. You lament only because the victim of your malignity is withdrawn from your power. Oh, it is not thus, interrupted the being. No sympathy may I ever find. I cannot believe that I am the same creature whose thoughts were once filled with sublime and transcendent visions of the beauty and majesty of goodness. But it is even so. The fallen angel becomes a malignant devil, yet even that enemy of God and man had friends. I am alone. I am an abortion to be spurned and trampled on. But it is true that I am a wretch. I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have devoted my creator to misery. Polluted by crimes and torn by the bitterest remorse, where can I find rest but in death? Fear not that I shall be the instrument of future mischief. My work is nearly complete. I shall seek the most northern extremity of the globe. I shall collect my funeral pile and consume to ashes this miserable frame. I shall die and exult in the agony of torturing flames. I shall no longer feel the agonies which now consume me. My ashes will be swept into the sea by the winds. Farewell. 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 Then he sprang from the cabin window upon his ice raft and was soon borne away by the waves and lost in darkness and distance. A new species would bless me as its creator. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me.